so uh, I think we have um, an two poll. How many polls? Here's the first one. Ha. So please tell us by taking a picture of that code if you can, or by entering the code that's there at menti.com. Please answer the prompt. What does improvisation mean to you? You can answer up to three words, I think, that we'll let you put in. Like, watch the word cloud appear. Adventure. about it so much. What we care about, we, we give. So look at that. There's very few that are the same. Whoever can count the same ones. I guess it looks like connection, <laughs> That's what community, we collaboration, freedom, life, creativity are most popular words. Great. Right. We have another poll for you. So I think there's another slide in the poll. What does business make you think of? Dun, 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 dun. Good. I see a bunch of hands. Who is Wendy Wasserstein? 
a playwright. She is a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright in the 90s in New York. She was pretty famous if you were in the theater, even if she wasn't a household name like Neil Simon. Um, and all of the actors who were asked this quiz confidently raised their hands, very happily, very proud of ourselves. Of course we know who Wendy Wasserstein is. She wrote the Heidi Chronicles, a lot of things. You may know that. And our board members all raised their hands. They knew who Wendy Wasserstein was. They were New York City intelligentsia. They knew Wendy Wasserstein. She was pretty famous. She was a Pulitzer Prize playwright. They'd seen her face. So we were like, oh, look at us. We all know who Wendy Wasserstein is. This is a stupid quiz. Then, Ms. Sarah said, how many of you know who Bruce Wasserstein is? How many of you know who Bruce Wasserstein Bruce Wasserstein was Wendy Wasserstein's brother. At the time, he was the head of a Boston Bank. He then went on to create a whole other group of banks, who was like a billionaire in the field of mergers and acquisitions. He was an advisor to the World Bank. He uh, died in his 60s uh, you know, as a billionaire with lots and lots of money. And he was credited with a huge amount of the mergers acquisition strategy power hub. In other words, a very, very influential, powerful the character who maybe even arguably had more influence on the world at this time than a playwright in New York. Maybe. Who knows? Yeah, so. So, just like none of us raised our hands here, none of the actors in this space raised our hands. Right? Bruce Wasserstein, who the heck is Bruce? 95% of the board members raised their hands. They all knew Bruce Wasserstein. This was an important epiphany for me, a huge epiphany for me, as a professional actor living in New York whose ambient narratives were Actors are the smartest people in the world, we're the coolest, we know everything, we're smarter than everybody else who's a civilian in the world. This would be the equivalent, by the way, this test of my saying to you, uh, how many of you know who Amy Poehler is? Right? How many of you know who Andrew Bosworth is? Very happy, very happy. Who's Andrew Bosworth? Yes, he's the chief technical officer at now Meta Facebook. Why, why am I sharing this test with you? It's good to know people with money. <laughs> know the client's needs. Yes, you're going to say the same thing? We have different references, yeah. We do have different references. And here was my takeaway, I'll say it again. I think that I'm the person with the knowledge and I know stuff it is much more likely that my clients or business people know more about improv or creativity or innovation or connection or good leadership skills than it is that I know about their business. Yeah? Now, I knew this, I talked about this all the time, this happened in the 90s for me, it helped, it gave me an epiphany on how to work with my clients. But then I had a new version of this epiphany, which was, oh, I'm a business owner, like I own a business. And I need to know, not just about improv, but I need to know how to run a business. So in the last, I would say, I don't know, just five years, these are some of the things that I've had to add into my network of knowledge and skills and help. So I, so I had to join professional networks. I read professional books about being an entrepreneur. I got tools to help me uh, have a client management system or to do accounting. All of these things. You have to get health savings accounts for your employees. You have to be able to pay payroll. If you want to do a podcast, there's so many ways to do it that there's all sorts of technical things you need. I realized, oh, I'm not just an improviser, I have to be a business owner. And that is not something to just make up. There's actually a field of people who help people start businesses. They're business consultants. There are all these tools 
there's all these ways to do things. There are people who are professionals who know about this, and it is a whole body of knowledge that is separate from no matter how good an improviser I am. Just like facilitation is a whole body of knowledge that actually has nothing to do with the principles. I joined uh, the entrepreneur organization, and I started going to these coaching sessions where they're going to help me scale my business. And I started going to these meetings, and the story in my head was, I'm not really a business owner. I'm a fake business owner. And I've just improvised everything in my life, and it's worked out. And, what, and now I have all these problems, so I'm here because I need help. And the first thing I realized was, oh, I'm exactly like all of these other people. My running my improv business is the same as that person over there trying to start a chocolate business, or that person who's selling RVs, or that person who's, you know, training courses, um, and I thought, oh, okay, I'm real. I'm really a business owner. I'm not a pretend business owner. And that was a revelation for me to focus on uh, for there. The first is strategy, people, clickers, execution, <laughs> execution, and cash. These are not words that feel probably very juicy for you, but let me tell you, if you are trying to make a living, if you're trying to spread your word out into the world, if you're trying to support people that are working with you and build a life for yourself, these are very important words. Right? Each one of these is a whole body of skills and knowledge and mindsets to shift on. So how do I differentiate myself? Okay, I'll tell you a secret. Saying you're an applied improviser no longer differentiates yourself. You look around the room. Uh, who are my clients? How am I going to work? What kind of work do I want? How am I going to design my life? How do I want to be living? Am I going to be a solopreneur? Am I going to bring in other people to work with me? What kind? What part of the work do I want to focus on? All of these are strategy questions. People. Who am I going to work with? And not only who am I going to work with, but how do I support them? I'll, I'll show you in a little bit the folks that I now have working with me full time and as contractors, and it has transformed me to be able to have those colleagues I always wanted to have people to play with, but I also then needed to learn a whole bunch of skills to support them. Because I found that I could teach leadership and team building, but to actually live it every day as a leader was super hard. There were things for me to learn about putting that actually into practice. Execution just means you, know, you, gotta, you gotta actually do it, and sometimes it's fine to improvise, sometimes you need some planning and structure around that. Uh, Laura Livingston used to say, I'm going to build a jungle gym so we can swing on it. What is the jungle gym you're going to build for yourself? And then cash is cash. <laughs> but it doesn't just mean if I, make it, if I make a lot of money from other people, I have enough money, right? It's what is, how am I going to invoice? When is that going to come in? How do I have stuff in the bank so that when all of a sudden my major client lays 10,000 people off, I can ride out that wave to like so those are some of the things to think about. Now, having said all of that, it doesn't mean that the principles of improv aren't important and that being an improviser doesn't make us great business people. The same way we go out into the world and we teach everyone in the world that improv applies to them, improv also applies to us. So our principles of improv these are just the way I listed them in the book originally, although we've all seen lots of, lots of models. Choose your own. All of these things have actually helped as a business owner when I think, okay, this is the role I'm playing right now. This is the scene I'm in. I'm actually a business owner. How do I practice what I preach? How do we walk our talk? So building trust both with my clients and with my uh, colleagues and employees. Being spontaneous, as much as I planned, as Eisenhower said, I think he mentioned this in the other session, planning is imperative, the plan is use useless. So being able to flex with the moment someone comes to us with a need, how do we adapt to it, uh, learning to talk to people at networking sessions, all of these things are our spontaneity skills. Listening. We may say more. Yes, and accepting what comes, right? In the pandemic, we had the best years we've ever had because we were able to flex immediately to learn how to work online and to respond to our new client needs and help them deal with the unexpected. 
Storytelling is not just a product for us, it's the way that we brand and market and connect with our customers is being able to be good storytelling as well as it being a product that we teach them. And then of course the presence. Right? How do you instill trust? How do you do all of those things? Um, these are my angels. I have a, a full-time employees, Chris Esparza, you know, who is here? Amazing. And Laura, and I have a whole network of people. One of the things that I've learned is I do not have to be alone. And this is what I do not understand, and I'm going to get there. Yes, click, click, click. I'm going to get there in a minute. I'm talking about reimagining. But I feel like it's very strange the way our, uh, how much of our work it, as improvisers building business is done individually and alone. And we come together, we network in all of these ways, like right now in this moment. I wanted playwrights who are on my team, where I can go back to my team and bitch about other people, <laughs> or say like, we want to win, right? We want to achieve these goals we're getting to do together. These people have been incredibly influential to me. Uh, one of the ways they've been influential, Chris joined my company about uh, almost two years ago now, I think. And um, he said, we need to do some values work. Like, not just think we know our values, but what are actually our values. And he walked us through a year and a half process of identifying them, just like any other business, but then putting them to action and combining our improv wisdom with our business acumen and saying, we want these, we're going to create them, and then we're going to make them behaviors. And how does improv show up for us, and how do we live it? We have play dates every week scheduled into our meetings to have a play meeting because it's one of our values. So this last bit in the last minute or so that I have with you is this question of reinventing ourselves. And here's what I think. I think as a community, we are reinventing ourselves all the time. We're always doing it. If you've experienced anything at this conference, it's the amazing ways that we are and are in reinventing ourselves every moment. It is our improvisational nature to continue to build, and yes, and create each other. But here are just a couple of thoughts about what I'm seeing and what I want to encourage. The first is that, as I say, we are not new anymore. Right? People know about improv. They know yes, and they know celebrating failure. It's out there in the world. So we can't just depend on, I have this new idea that you've never heard of, that I'm going to then introduce to you, and you're like, wow, you're so brilliant. What comes next? How do we yes and those ideas and help deliver them in ways that are service, just like when you're a lawyer saying, hey, there's a law, is it the way you started? <laughs> we know and we're learning, we've gone to many, many sessions, you've heard that improv is not just uh, one-off activities, training sessions where we play games, it is a way of life, it is a mindset. Brilliant Jean Lambin that talks about that all the time, don't mind her if you don't know who she is. Um, it is a way of life. We heard this from Joel and Tiger yesterday. It is a way of reformatting families and schools and societies. It is not just a set of activities. And we don't have to work alone. I have a vision, friends. I have a dream of a consultancy that rivals PricewaterhouseCoopers, Accenture, where we are all coming together and working together to take over the world. Come talk to me about it. And uh, who knows what comes next? We don't know what comes next. Uh, I am over my time, so I will just uh, let you know that uh, there are all sorts of things that we're doing. You don't have to hear about that. Uh, here's the activity we're going to do that do for yourself. Pick up anything, an object, any object. Think about its quali qualities, and then decide how those qualities are new performances you want to adopt. Uh, I have a poem for you, a Shakespearean sonnet that I will end with. About applied improv, when life's grand stage unfolds before our eyes and works demands that require a deft hand, embrace the art of improv as it flies to navigate the course where dreams expand. In spontaneity, we find the key to face each challenge with a fearless heart. With open minds, we shape our destiny, adapting swiftly, playing our own part. Let not the scripted fears control our fate, but trust in instinct, seize the moment's cue, as actors do on life's wide canvas, create through trials and errors, growth that shall ensue. 
with principles of improv as our guide, in life and work, our spirit shall abide. That brought to you by our friend ChatGPT. If you think the other AI does not understand human emotion or have wisdom to offer, that is crowdsourced from all of us. So, I, here's what I will leave you with. As we reimagine, let us embrace everything that comes next. And I look forward to exploring with you. Thank you. Hey, everybody. I'm Melissa. Hi. I first went into business for myself in 1996, but I didn't actually start my consultancy until 2017. When I first went into business, it was as an artist, and then as a creativity instigator, and if you are feeling at all creatively stuck, I have a book in the resource table. There are four copies left. In any case, in 27 years of being in business, I discovered that artists and applied improv folks actually have a lot of overlaps, especially when it comes to money. Let's see if I'm going to clear the work. Yeah, there we go. There's some money on the screen. Right so when I was invited by Kirsten to be part of this panel, I thought that I would share with you some money lessons that I've learned in 27 years of being in business by illustrating them with some maybe horror stories that fit with the category of the good, the bad, and the ugly, I mean the reimagined. But one of the things I've also learned in my many years of being on the planet as a human is that when it comes to presentations, the ones that are most impactful and most memorable are ones that have some kind of embodiment, some kind of interactive element. And if I were just to share with you the stories that I planned originally to share, that would take up all of my time. So instead, what I decided to do is to share five lessons at a high level, money lessons, and then I'm going to go back and focus on the first couple, and then we're going to do an embodiment. So, here we go. Clicker, clicky thing. Clicky thing. Clicky thing. Clicky thing, maybe if we all say it together. Clicky thing. Lesson number one, get out of your client's pockets. So by this I mean, just because you may not have the money or the willingness to pay that big number that you're putting out there for the product or service that you're offering, it doesn't mean that your client doesn't. So get out of your client's pockets. That's lesson number one. Okay, maybe we don't have slides for... Apparently that's the end of the slideshow. Alright, lesson number two... May not have a slide, but lesson number two... Is... I have to remember, because I don't have my slide to remind me. Give me a moment. Lesson number two is state your price and then shut up. Yeah, can I have some snaps for that? Your client's probably going to have a reaction to your price. Let them have their reaction. Just shut up. Lesson number three, don't be afraid of no. You may very well get some initial resistance to that price that you put out there. And that initial resistance might be, we can't, we can't afford that. No. That doesn't mean the deal is off. 
they're just having some feelings. They might need to figure out how they're going to pay for it. I have some good stories about this. Hit me up later. I can tell you the good stories. Just don't be afraid of them. Lesson number four, sell the value that you create, not your time. Thank you, slide person. Tyler, you are wonderful. You are not actually selling your time. You're selling transformation. We could do an entire conference about this concept of value-based pricing. Your client is not buying your time, they're buying transformation. So sell the value that you create. Lesson number five, remember that your price assigns value. So if you're tempted to lower your price because you're afraid that that big high price is going to scare people away, I got news for you. Your low price might be scaring people away because they think that it can't be worth anything. It's too cheap. I got stories about that too. I almost didn't get my foot in the door at Facebook. I've done a lot of work at Facebook. I almost didn't get, didn't get my foot in the door because they thought it couldn't be worth anything because I was pricing too cheap. All right, so let's go back. Tyler, if you could take me back to slide number one, lesson number one. Back when I was a professional working artist, I did a lot of work on commission, and the, one of the main products that I sold was Jewish marriage contracts. There's a traditional part of every Jewish wedding ceremony, it's called a ketubah. And I did a lot of these by hand, and I was meeting with a couple, actually, to do uh, one of these documents for their 20th wedding anniversary. So we're sitting around my kitchen table, and it turned out they had flown across the country to meet with me. And they're telling me all the elements they want in this big document. They want really uh, elaborate paper cutting of order and paper cut fine work. And then around the paper cutting, they want illuminated gold leaf with this geometric design and lots of different colors. I'm taking all these notes and I'm realizing this is, this is getting very, very complex, and very elaborate, and very time consuming. It's going to be very expensive. And I'm realizing this is going to be probably the most expensive job I've ever done for our clients. And I'm getting very nervous. I'm thinking, they're not going to pay this. And I get to the point where I have to quote them a price. And so I say, well, you know, this design, absolutely, I can make this for you. And it's, uh, it's, it's on the, definitely on the high end of my price range. And, you know, you're looking at about $5,000. But then because I'm so nervous, I don't stop there. And I say, but, you know, if you, if you can't afford that, then I can always scale back the design and make something more in the three or $4,000 price range. Side note, scaling back the design never happens. I would just make the same damn thing and just charge them less money. And those words come out of my mouth and I just want to push them back in, but it's too late. And the husband says, well, 3000 4000 5000 that's all the same to me, but I'm a middle-of-the-road kind of guy. $4,000. So, in the span of about 10 seconds, I bargained myself out of $1,000 because I couldn't, slide number two please, state my price and shut up. So, now, let's get on with the embodiment part of this presentation. What I was thinking we could do now is Using those first two principles, I would love for each of you to think about a service that you either already offer or would like to offer, and think about that price in your head 
that you would really like to charge. Everybody have that price in your head? Now what I would like you to do is take that price and dump it. Now if that's just absolutely so hard, it's going to make you throw up. Just raise it by 20%. But what I really want, I really want you to be, feel uncomfortable. Like that price really needs to make you sweat. Like it really needs to make you uncomfortable. If that price is not making you uncomfortable, you need to raise it for the purposes of this exercise. Now in a moment, not just yet, but in a moment, you are going to find a partner. Because what I want you to do is in a moment, not just yet, you're going to turn your partner and you're going to determine who is A and who is B. And in a moment, not just yet, partner A is going to turn to partner B. And you're going to think about what is the value that you are creating with your service. And you are going to say to partner B, the investment for value that I create with my service is, and you're going to state the number. So for example, and you're going to say it like, please pass the salt. No charge. And you're going to notice in your body what's happening as you're saying this. Is it making you feel nauseous? Is it making your knees numb? Is it making you sweat? Pay attention to all those things that are happening. And partner B, you're going to pay attention as well. So, for example, the investment for taking your cohort of researchers through my experience that helps them connect and communicate better to make them more influential leaders is $150,000. Then partner B, that's the, the transformation that I create, then partner B, you are going to have a reaction. A strong reaction. Now it could be like, great, let me sign on the dotted line. Or it could be like, holy fuck, are you kidding me? Just have some kind of reaction. Partner A, just you know, let them have their reaction and state your price and shut up. Am I making logic? Is this all clear? And then you're going to switch. Okay? Now, the way that we're going to come back from this, because it's going to get really loud in a moment, is I'm going to raise my hand. And when you see me raise my hand, you're going to raise your hand. And it's going to be attached to your chin. And it's going to make your chin, your jaw close. And you're going to shut up. And turn and face me. Does that make sense? Okay. Any questions on how this is going to work? Question. Are you basically the investment that's the investment for your client or how much you're charging? That's the investment that you are asking your client to pay you for the service that you are offering. You're stating your price. Yeah. Any other questions? No, it doesn't have to be a negative reaction. It can be whatever reaction partner B decides you want it to be. It could be fun to make it a negative reaction, but you get to decide. Any other questions? Okay, go. Too expensive. 
No, no, from the, the experience that you just did, oh, back and forth. That was too expensive. <laughs> to, to the experience was too expensive. The expensive was too expensive. That's very powerful. The incremental difference of going up even 30% still sounded like a reasonable amount. The incremental experience of going up 30% still felt like a reasonable amount. About my own shedding. Double it and have practice it on the town. Yeah. My partner still didn't charge him that. Partner did still didn't charge him that. Yeah, back then. As my partner was having their reaction, I found myself, okay, to so make your breath, so I could do something instead of reacting to my kind of breathing. You had to breathe. Who else had to breathe? Good to notice. Yeah, back there, Joey. Response was so positive, upsold another <laughs> service as an option. Excellent. Talk to Joey for, for more ideas. All right, I'm out of time. Thank you so much, everybody. Turn it up, DJ. Six nine percent. It's 
more important to be relatable. Hello, that's our middle name, okay, than polished. We don't do that so much here. People are watching on average 17 hours of videos a week. Who is doing that in this room? Really? Have you not heard of Netflix? Does that include Netflix? I'm not sure if it does, because then I might be up there with that. Superstore is very good. A couple more stats. 83% of marketers are saying it's gotta be less than one minute. Okay? And you gotta make it look good on a camera, on a little phony thing, not a flip phone. Okay? It can't be the wide angle. Yeah? Instagram style. That means that way. <laughs> when I walked up on here, 90% of you thought the same thing. <laughs> what was it? Nice dress, nice dress thank you. <laughs> More like, that girl ate a lot of donuts on the first day. Yeah, and then everyone is thinking, 90% of you only are thinking, what's in it for me? 10% of you are thinking, what's in it for me? And does she know she sings very badly? <laughs> yes, she does know that. You are all humans above improvisers. Your clients are humans with problems. And they are always thinking, as soon as you start talking, why do I care? I have YouTube and Tony Robbins to watch. Why would I listen to you? You must make it very clear in the first seven seconds if you're good. And please don't start with how my name is and today I'll be talking about. That goes after the first seven seconds. Okay? We care who you are, but not really. First I care about me, and then I care about who you are and what you can give to me. Unless your mother treats that. She might do it the other way. Okay, it's your big day. Okay, you swipe right. They swept you off your feet, and you feel the desire to make a lifelong death till we part contract to this person. Dun dun da da, finished. It's the vow time. Not the vow time, the vow time is for the honeymoon, huh? The vow time. And your beloved looks at you with those eyes full of love. And then their lips open, those delicious kissable lips, and they say, read this. Would you trust a person that could not convey their love, their passion, and their perfectly scripted by ChatGPT vows to you on your big day? I would not could not give my fertile years to a man who could not express his passion for me with words, with body language. And yet, what happens to us? Speaking of looking good, we go over to good old LinkedIn. And what do we do? Do we post videos? Nine of you do, and the rest of you go text, text, text. Blah, 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 someone will read this past three lines. Text is very, <laughs> hashtag pre-COVID, okay? Our attention spans are very, what? Are very short. And so when you go over there, you have to remember, people are always thinking about you. No, they're not. What's in it for me? And so if you use your videos, your speaking career, your body language, your voice, your energy, your passion, you're going to reach people's hearts. And that leads to the credit card. Yes? And we're forgetting about that. Text is just doesn't cut it anymore in the world of competing with YouTube. I wasn't always this happily ever after. <laughs> 100 subscribers on YouTube, living in Barcelona struggling to create a career. I once was desperate, still can't. I once was desperate for money, and I went to the dark side. Please work because it's dramatic. No. It's so dramatic my practice. Oh, insurance sales is the dark side, get it? Uh, if you haven't done insurance sales, it is. So I'm 30 years old, and I'm going up to construction sites. And I would yell up to the roofer, roofers are pleasant men. 
And that's not sexist, they're only men. And I would say, hey, buddy, who's gonna pay your rent when you fall down? Very assertive, yes? And he would say, go away. And to men, he would say the F word, but not to me. Every day, mini skirts. Me, not them. And out of 100 men who would agree to meet me at a Tim Hortons to talk, one of them wanted insurance. One of them wanted a free donut. And one was very lonely. And this career did not go very well. Yes? But I learned something extremely important from the insurance business about videos. What can it be? What does the insurance do very well? I know it's a hard question. I will tell you. They don't sell insurance. They sell the benefits. They do not show you a piece of paper with a bunch of text on it. It's like 85 pages long. That is not good for the environment. They don't sell insurance. They sell how you will feel with your family afterwards not living under a bridge. This we can apply to us. We are selling, ah, we are selling the tool. Oh, oh, this is just too cute. This is how I felt as an insurance girl. Lost, confused. Sorry, TikTok got me. See, that's how it works. TikTok gets you. So we do need to compete with monkeys and Tony Robbins. The bad, 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 bad little improvisers. We hate sales. I tried to find the scariest image online. Is it? It's pretty gross, right? My sister wouldn't let me show my nieces. And I said, that's how we feel about sales. It's a reality, folks. We sell something. And once we accept that, in therapy and in the 12-step programs, we can move on. Okay? Stop selling the tool. The tool is improv. Nobody wants improv. Not even you. You want the benefits of improv. Okay? Nobody wants insurance. Nobody wants improv. They want what they get out of it. So stop focusing on hashtag improv rocks. Okay? Connection rocks. Getting married might rock. Okay? Getting over your social anxiety might rock. But improv does not rock. Focus on what they are Googling. They don't Google, what's my life missing? Is it improv? No. Yeah? Give people what they are Googling. Google it. Sell the outcome. Delicious refreshment, happiness, joy, connection. How to get there, how to do videos. Huh? Help, them, help them get to the outcome, and then the outcome's not the end. Then you have to get to the feeling of it afterwards. The results. What will their teams get? What will they get? How will their lives be improved? Will they get better interviews? Will they be happier? Will they be thinner? Does improv make you thinner? Not with that band yet. That was good last night, eh? Yeah, like five pieces. Okay. Ooh, look at that. <laughs> Shake it up. Help them visualize the benefits. And that's why you use video. Because we use our eyes and we get connected with that. And so if you're using text, it's very hard for me to imagine a better life with my husband in a new job if you just write it in text. Okay? Video is our friend. All the single legs. Okay, what problem do you solve? Okay. In one sentence. Shut it out, what do you solve? I was too slow. What are they Googling? I, I want to know what I can recommend you for. What do you solve? Happier employees. Happier employees, great. Company culture. Company culture. Cooperation. Okay. World peace. World peace. How do I get world peace? Does anyone solve crappy pointers? Okay, we're not gonna play worst kid because you know how to play, but essentially you guys solve a problem and you're experts. And I want you to start thinking like that when you start publishing things. I want you to like go generalist. Everyone in the world needs improv. Yeah, they're called good communication skills. Everybody needs pants, okay? The British and the American way of saying them. But Lululemon <laughs> does not focus on teenage boys. Lululemon focuses on 40 year olds who are trying yoga out and want to impress the girl next to her who's better at yoga than her, okay? Lululemon doesn't focus on everyone. You cannot focus on everyone. Somebody like
likes you, somebody doesn't like you, and your video should go to that niche, to that target market. That's when your videos are going to get interesting to people. And that's a game. Oh, there he is again. He's so cute. Okay. Oh no, you have to wait. Okay, improv skills are very scary to almost everyone in the world, so stop calling it that. This is very interesting. Why do you watch videos? Okay? 32% say to help me relax and unwind. And only 11% say to learn something new. So you need to talk about stuff that they're interested in. And if you don't have a niche, what the heck are you trying to interest them in? You need to know, is it cat videos in improv? Yeah, is it single people in improv? Is it company culture in improv? Mix them so that you're motivated to make the videos and people are motivated to watch them because you have grabbed their interest and you're going to entertain them. We must be entertaining. I have one minute left. Uh, so I'm gonna go through here. I'm just gonna tell you, there's a lot of places that you can speak. I'm at the beginning of my career. We, we can measure things now, right? And so this is something that um, Nancy Watt has introduced us to, about measuring the effects of adaptability. Improv is hard to measure, but if we put it with adaptability intelligence, there are 15 different components of this adaptability. And so we've been using this to measure how adaptable are you? And then you can go in with a 20 minute test and you can actually measure if they've improved in the 15 different components. So we usually work on mindset. Nancy works on unlearn, environment, character, ability. Okay, this is how you can show that you've made an improvement in what you solve. This is our solution to, you can't measure improv. Talk to us later. And I just wanted to go through this real quick. Okay, been on a lot of stages. And that's just one, but there's a lot. Okay, been on a lot of stages. And there's a lot of places that you can go for free and paid, but mostly for free. Speakers, 80% of the time, we don't get paid to get bay on stages. But then one of you in the audience tells your friend at Google, Miguel. <laughs> And word of mouth works. So, oh God, did I pause on that one? It's horrible. <laughs> further, further, further. You can go to this thing called Fuck Up Nights. You can go to tech events. You can go to professional speaking associations. You can go to Toastmasters, to Rotary, to Lions Clubs. You can go to children's organizations. You can go to teens. You can go to TikTok. You can go to a lot of places to get your voice heard. Yeah? This guy that we know. Come on, baby. Okay, he's not my baby, but I just meant the clicker with my baby. Andrew Tarvin, he's one of our guys. 13 million views. 13 million views. How many have you written a book? Yeah, do you have 13 million reads? One good video could get you 13 million views. Video is extremely powerful. If you'd love to talk to me afterwards, I would love to tell you how you need to get back on stages and use your body. <laughs> use your voice, use your passion. Uh, in India, in China, Japan, Singapore, professional speakers associations. And I'm gonna leave you with this last slide because this is where you can scan. Oh, there you are in Barcelona. Welcome to the world of videos. Uh, are you an expert? Yes, you are. Okay, here are a couple associations, a couple groups that you can scan right now as I get off stage because it's your break time, where you can get speaking opportunities. The Global Speakers Summit is 17 of the professional speakers associations in the world. We're meeting in Bali in a year and two months, and the NSA is part of it. How many of you in the NSA? National Speaking Association? Five of you. We should all be there because we have words that are important to share. And how many have you done TED Talks? We have ideas we're spreading, guys. Please, get that voice out there and I'll see you on YouTube.